All right, lesson 13. Grandma had already eaten her breakfast. She was at the stove fixing ours. Sausage patties, which reminded me of the brakeman, and buttermilk biscuits and fried eggs over easy. Mary Alice turned up promptly, looking perky and innocent. I remembered Skipper. When Grandma's back was turned, Mary Alice broke open a biscuit and stuck a sausage patty inside it. Then she pushed it down her skirt. She knew I was watching, but she didn't meet my eye. The eggs were runny, so that was a problem for her. She thought about making an egg sandwich to go up with the other biscuit, but gave it up. When Grandma turned back to the table, Mary Alice had licked her platter clean. She skidded out of her chair and was gone back upstairs. Grandma gave her departing figure a long look. She'd mentioned that the night air would cool her brew to soap, so we went outside to see. The embers were white, and sure enough, the pot was solid with soap, something like soap. It reminded me of the cheese she fed the catfish, and it didn't smell much better. My job was to pry it out of the pot. Grandma hunkered in the grass with the butcher knife to carve it into cakes. This here is good soap, she remarked as she went at it with the knife. It lathers good and it'll take the top layer of skin right off you. The sun hadn't been up long and the morning glories were just beginning to unfurl. Then far down the road, a cloud of dust appeared, heading for town. Nearer it was, nearer, it was Miss Eubanks, the strings of her sunbonnet flying. She was standing up in her buckboard with a whip in her hand. Her old straw-hatted mule was galloping. I'd never seen a mule break into a trot, let alone a full gallop. The buckboard sped past the house, never slowing for town. Grandma stood up to watch it pass, fingering her chin thoughtfully. She gave me the chore of scraping out the soap pot, which looked like a long day's work. I had to roll the pot in the grass and climb halfway in with a wire brush to loosen the clinging soap. It was a mean job, and some very strange-smelling stuff had gone into that soap. Grandma said that the full recipe for it would die with her. In an hour's time, I hadn't made a dent in it. By then, Mary Alice had come out on the back porch, wearing her tap shoes. She began to run through one of her routines, calling out the steps. Shuffle ball, change, step, step. Shuffle ball, change, step, step. I was scraping away on the pot, and she was tapping away on the porch. And if you asked me, she was acting entirely too innocent. We heard a clopping of hooves and a jangle of harness, and here came Miss Eubanks in her buckboard back from uptown. She swerved into Grandma's side yard and drew up. The old mule was foaming at the mouth and looked near death. Its straw hat was hanging from an air. Miss Eubanks dropped down and lit running. She pounded on the back porch, shoving Mary Alice aside. But even Miss Eubanks didn't quite dare to storm into Grandma's house. She gave the screen door a savage rattle, though. Grandma appeared big behind screen wire. Well, Idella, she said, what have you got a burr up under your tail about now? Miss Eubanks was wheezing. She turned up the sleeves of her feed sack dress. I need my girl back. You got her in there. What have I got that's yours? Grandma queried. Vandalia, you got her. She didn't come home last night and she ain't at work today. She was seen coming in this house. That girl done brought her Miss, Miss Eubanks poked a finger in Mary Alice's face, which was frozen with fear. I was observing the scene over the rim of the soap pot, and I was all eyes. Who's seen her come in here, Grandma said? I didn't. Everybody in town, Miss Eubanks barked. Grandma nodded. She knew everybody knew everything, often before it happened. Well, let me tell you how it'll be, Idella, Grandma said in a reasonable voice. If you want to search my house, you'll have to get past me, and I'll tell you something else for free. If you set a foot over that door sill, I'll wring your red neck. Miss Eubanks made one of her fists and seemed about to put it through the screen door. She was dancing with rage. With a strangled cry, she dashed off the porch, heading for the buckboard. Her old mule saw her coming and shied. She rattled off the property, and, Miss, and Mary Alice stood there on the porch, wilting. Things quieted down after that. Grandma disappeared from the screen door. I went back to scraping the pot, and pretty soon Mary Alice went back to practicing her tap. But real slow, her timing was all off. By noon, I knocked off work for a stop at the privy before dinner. I was almost in it with only one thing on my mind when something moved in the cob house. Somebody was there, and he stepped out onto my path. I nearly jumped over the privy. It was a guy in a tight suit, a high collar, and a silk necktie. I'd seen him uptown, but I couldn't put a name to him. He looked me over and decided I was old enough that he'd have to deal with me. Junior Stubbs, he said putting out a hand to shake. Ah, I said, could you wait a minute? When I came out of the privy, he gave me a business card that read, Stubbs and Askew, General Insurance Agents, Wind and Fire Coverage, Our Specialty. I'm in business with my daddy, he explained. 
Meryl Stubbs. I fingered the card. I doubt if my grandma is in the market for any insurance. Mrs. Dowdle, he said. Oh, no, you can't sell her anything. He had a jiggly Adam's apple, I noticed. It happened. I happened to be passing, he said. Between the cob house and the privy? Well, no. He looked down at his shoes. I was holed up here to tell you the truth. I'm on my lunch hour. You got Vidalia Eubanks in your house, am I right? Everybody says so, I said. Why? Do you want to sell Vandalia some insurance? No, he said. I want her. I blinked in the midday sun while he waited for me to work this out. Could you get a message to Vandalia? He asked, pulling out another one of his cards. You can read what's on the back of it. Just to show you, I mean business. I turned the card over and read. Come steal away with me, sweetheart. Let nothing no longer keep us apart. Break yourself free of your mother's rule. She never knew love, and she's just being cruel. I love you, honey, Junior. My ears burned like fire. Now that I was 13, it took less than this to embarrass me. Do your best, he said. It's now or never for me. If your old ma gets her, if her old ma gets her home again, I'm a dead duck. Tell Vandalia, I'll be back in the cob house tonight by dark with hope in my heart. Then Junior cut out. I watched him scale Grandma's back fence in his suit. By mid-afternoon, I'd done all I could do on the soap pot, and a nickel was burning a hole in my pocket. I was thinking hard about a knee-high, but before I could make my escape, a car pulled up in front of Grandma's house, a 1930 Ford Model A sedan. A lady and a man got out and started up the front walk. I went in the kitchen door, not wanting to miss anything. Grandma was already at the front door, and Mary Alice was hanging around the foot of the stairs that led up to the bedrooms. I palmed Junior's poem to her, and she stuck it down the front of her shirt, where the sausage sandwich had, sandwich had gone earlier gone. Junior will be in the cob house by nightfall, I murmured, and Mary Alice nodded. Whatever you're selling, Merle, Merrill, Grandma was saying at the front door, I don't want any. Mr. Merle Stubbs and his wife overflowed the front door. Now, Mrs. Dowdle, I'm not here in my professional capacity. I have took time off work and brought Mrs. Stubbs with me to have a friendly word with you. They got their feet in the door, and, Miss, and Grandma let them take chairs in the front room. What do you want, she said, not sitting. Nothing in the world but to chat with you on a private matter, Mr. Stubbs shifted one leg over the other. There's no private matters in this town, Merrill, Grandma said. Everybody's private business is public property. Yes, and you've stuck your nose in ours, Mrs. Stubbs said, speaking up sharp. You got that Eubanks gal upstairs this minute, Mrs. Stubbs glared at the ceiling. She's trying to steal my son, and you're helping her out. She's gotten away from her ma, so she's halfway there. Grandma's spectacles, spectacles flashed her a warning, but Mr. Stubbs said, Now, now, Mrs. Stubbs is upset and off her feet about our boy, Junior. He's lost all his judgment and wants to marry Eubanks. Do tell. Grandma's big arms were folded in front of her. So what? We've got a position in the community, Mr. Stubbs said. We don't need a connection with such as the Eubankses. I'm as democratic as the next guy, but there's limits. Besides, Adela Eubanks is half cracked and it could run in the family. Think of the children. Have you talked it over with Junior, Grandma asked. You can't talk sense to him, Mrs. Stubbs replied. He's bewitched. Mary Alice and I lurked near, taking in every word. About the only thing Vandalia and Junior had going for them as a couple was that they weren't cousins. Thud occurred then. Mary Alice and I both heard it. Something hit the outside of the house. Nothing loud, just a thud. Grandma heard. She began to drift towards the front door, but she went on talking to the Stubbses. Well, it's no skin off my nose, she said calmly, but seems like your boy's old enough to make up his own mind. How old is he? Thirty, Mrs. Stubbs said, but he's a young thirty. Grandma was at the front door now. She pulled it open and stalked outside. We all followed, naturally, to find her in the middle of the yard with her hands on her hips, staring back at the house. A ladder had appeared, propped against the sill of an upstairs bedroom window. On the top of the ladder was Miss Idella Eubanks in her sunbonnet. She was working away, trying to jimmy loose the catch on the window screen. Grandma gazed. Of all the invasions of her privacy, this one took the cake. For the love of Pete, Mrs. Stubbs, looking up, shading her eyes. It's that trashy Eubanks woman trying to get her girl back. I hope she does. I hope she takes her home and sticks her down the well. Miss Eubanks had noticed the yard below had filled up with people, but now she had the screen loose and was ducking under to get inside. She had one knee on the sill. That's as far as she got. Grandma strolled over and took the ladder in both hands. 
She jerked it free of the ground and it fell scraping down the house. It must have seemed to Miss Eubanks that the world had dropped out from under her. She had one knee on the windowsill and the rest of her was in space. She grabbed the window screen and it came with her as she fell. She was in the air a long moment, turning as she dropped, legs working hard. Then she crashed through the snowball bushes, still clutching the screen. Jumping Jehoshaphat, Mr. Stubbs cried, and she's not insured. The top of a nodding snowball had snagged her sunbonnet, but Miss Eubanks herself was down among the roots, beginning to crawl out from under the bushes that had broken her fall. Again, she was wheezing. Forgetting their differences, Mr. Stubbs would have gone to her aid, but Mrs. Stubbs took them in hand and held, headed to their ford. Over her shoulder, Mrs. Stubbs called back, I hope this puts an end to the entire unfortunate business, and I don't want any more interference from you, Mrs. Dowdle. Get in the car, Lula, Mr. Stubbs said, and they gunned away as fast as a ford goes. Miss Eubanks sat in the yard, dazed. Grandma stood above her. There's my property line, she said, pointing it out. Get over it. Miss Eubanks limped away, steaming. Where'd she parked her mule, I didn't know. It was still alive, if it was still alive. She turned around just as Grandma's off Grandma's territory. You done abdicted my, uh, my girl, she howled, but I'll get her back. You watch. I looked up at the bedroom window with the missing screen. A face appeared there briefly, ghostly pale, and it wasn't Skipper, the puppy. By eight o'clock that night, the whole town knew everything. Defying his parents, Lula and Merle, Junior Stubbs was known to be in Grandma's cop house waiting to make his move. And Vandalia Eubanks, tucked away upstairs in Grandma's house, was ready to make hers, in spite of her half-cracked mother, Idella. The Wabash Cannonball train was due through on its run between Detroit and St. Louis. It was going to make its usual quick stop at 817, and the runaway couple were going to elope on it. Everybody said so. The Coffee Pot Cafe was doing its best business in several years because its front windows looked out on the depot. Um, word had spread people had driven from all over the county to witness the showdown the Stubbses meant to be on the platform to talk Junior out of it the whole Eubanks clan was coming to town to get Vandalia back nobody agreed on how many big brothers she had but there were several things didn't go according to plan though when the Wabash Cannonball steamed in on schedule the town bulged with people but the lovebirds Junior and Vandalia were absent the cannonball pulled out without them, leaving Marilyn, Lula Stubbs, and all of the Eubankses milling on the platform. The train gathered speed past Grandma's house, and Grandma was at the front door to see it go through. Mary Alice watched from an upstairs window, bedroom window. But then, with a piercing shriek that rent the evening air, the powerful locomotive set its brakes. It skidded a quarter of a mile before it could come to a stop. There was a little haze that night, a little mist. Down by the haunted timber, a deathly figure stood, shrouded in black, swinging an old-time lantern. The phantom brakeman seemed to hover between the tracks, dimly bathed in yellow lantern light. The engineer stuck his head out of the locomotive and stared down the track with widening eyes. Before he could send the firemen to investigate, the ghostly figure had vanished in the haze, melted in the mist. But it gave Vandalia and Junior their chance. They came up hand in hand from the other side of the Wabash tracks, and scrambled aboard the open platform at the back of the parlor car. When the cannonball pulled out again, they were on it, together, at last. That was one night Grandma didn't have to wake herself up to go to bed. As I came in the front room, she was there in her platform rocker, saying to Mary Alice, Next time you bring a stray home, make it a puppy, Mary Alice stared. You can call it Skipper, Grandma suggested. Well, how did you kn know? I heard you tell your brother that Vandalia Eubanks was a puppy. I can hear all over the house. I got ears on me like an Indian scout, and I don't sleep. Grandma looked up at me. Did you get everything squared away, she asked. And yes, I had. I'd taken off Grandpa Dowdle's big old black overcoat and put it back in the cob house with the old lantern where I'd found them. You get it? He was the phantom brakeman.